fresh review, if you look at this whiteboard, or, or if you can see this whiteboard, Bible-believing Christianity starts with the Bible, obviously. And the Lord Jesus Christ set up the foundations and the right doctrines. The apostles came out and the other Bible-believing Christians who were born out of that. The churches were on fire, the early churches. However, what happened, if you recall throughout our history lesson, there was a corruption of paganism being mixed up. There was a lot of paganism being mixed up. And then because of that, a monster was born downstream. And the Roman Catholic religion was born. It's also mingled with higher education. Remember that higher education is one of the number one detrimental things that could ever happen in our history. It just killed everything because of the rise of humanistic thinking. That's the idea, the rise of humanistic thinking. When you combine that with the Bible, you get a monstrosity. That's how you get the different modern Bible versions, right? I've explained that to you with higher and lower criticism, textual criticism. These are their favorite terms and you don't have to know what they mean because you don't believe in modern Bible versions anyway. Amen. So when we look down here, Constantine, he was one of the earliest guys who started this mess. You can say he was practically the first pope. Then after that, catechism, some uh, Catholic doctrines or heresies were seeping here and there, building one by one with uh, Roman leaders and then the bishops and then the popes. And then finally we re reach where the Catholic Church has become very powerful and ruled empires. Pagan Rome fell away and transformed into religious Rome. So we've studied that in our history. In the meantime, remember the Bible-believing churches, they were from Antioch, Syria. And that's where the King James Bible came from. Baptists, I don't say that the first Baptist was John the Baptist. No, that's Baptist bride heresy. But Baptist distinctives were born ever since from the beginning of Christianity. And then I've given some interesting uh, examples about the early or ancient Baptists. Now, remember, they weren't called Baptists, but per se, we can realize they were Baptists in what way? One of the biggest distinctions, remember, was the doctrine of water baptism. That's what distinguished them from the Roman Catholics. Yeah. That's what distinguished them from Roman Catholics. They believed in a proper salvation, salvation by faith, not by works, and that baptism was after salvation, Baptism was after salvation. There was no infant sprinkling. Amen. And then baptism was done properly in that sense. Some of them were uh, believed in immersion. Now remember, there were, this is not to say they were not free from wrong doctrine. So recall that the mainstream historians, and remember, it's always mainstream that's corrupt anyways yeah. today. Amen. So don't rely on the mainstream. I only use mainstream to make them look like fools, okay? Amen. But mainstream historians, they're going to point these people out as wackos, and then these guys, like the good guys. Why? Because they were higher educated. Higher educated jackals, that's what I think. Amen. Now, the thing is this. When the mainstream tells you one thing, remember, it's always the opposite. Because when was God ever mainstream throughout history, oh, yeah. throughout your Bible? It was never mainstream. It was always the minority. It's always the wacko guys, okay? So yes, they were not free from wacko doctrine, but compared with these guys, I don't know who's wackier. Yeah. I don't know who's more corrupt. Remember, during that time, they didn't have the freedom like you did with all the Bible-believing truth in your hands and the scriptures in their hands to study. They all memorized verses more than you did, for crying out loud. So they had to have pieces of the Bible and then pass down information. That's, and then the King James Bible was later born from that. We got Paulicians. They followed the Apostle Paul. That's close to dispensational as you can get, is the Paulicians for right doctrine. And then the, Valde the Valdas or Waldensians, they memorized scripture. And then later on, with this KJV early roots and uh, Baptist distinctives early roots, we finally reach the church of Philadelphia. If you might recall, we went through different church periods. They were the church of Ephesus, and then we went down to the church of Smyrna. Then we went down to the church of Pergamos, the church of Thyatira, the church of Sardis, 
And now we're in between. It's like the end of the Church of Sardis and Church of Philadelphia. Revelation chapter 3, verse 7. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth, and no man shutteth, and shutteth, and no man openeth. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. Notice right here, the time of the Philadelphia church period is distinguished as a little bit of strength, but no one can stop them. This is why, if you look at uh, Larkin and Ruckman, how they do the time periods, with uh, church history, they would uh, have Luther as a part of that. So they would put Luther in Sardis or they would put him in Philadelphia. Either or the time period that we're covering has to do with the end of Sardis to the beginning of Philadelphia, we can say. Okay. So that's the time period that we are now covering. You can definitely see Luther is that type where no one can stop him. And we're going to uh, read some of that. If you recall in our last uh, discipleship class about Luther, for some of you who don't know and this is your first time, you can look at our playlist on YouTube and then you'll see Discipleship Intermediate. Not beginners, but intermediate. Go to the last video in that playlist and then you'll see me talking about Luther. Remember, Luther, he was a rough guy. And if people want to get on me for my rough language they don't know rough language you know these calvinist pansies they always criticize me for being you know rude and crude with my speech i get that online but their hero luther their hero luther had a foul mouth a worth a worse language problem than i did some of these uh some of these jokers man these calvinists don't really know their history like they profess to know now, I'm not going to really say each and every word what he said, but uh, <laughs> so it's so amazing. People get on, uh, on, uh, on Bible believers, well, you're a Ruckmanite, you know. Well, then why don't they make a big deal about their congregation named Lutheran? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Following a man, <laughs> hypocrites. <laughs> and Calvinists, they call themselves Calvinists yeah. after John Calvin. Good, well, whatever, Ruckmanite then, so be it, you know. <laughs> This is what Luther roared against King Henry VIII, and I'm reading Dr. Upman's church history book. So in his church history book, uh, uh, I uh, cut off the page, uh, it's 471, page 471, uh, he gives a quote from Luther, and this is how Luther roared against King Henry VIII. He openly and deliberately lies, now that damnable rottenness and worm deliberately and consciously concocts lies against the majesty of my king in heaven. Granted that he is the defender of the church, yet it is of the purple-clad, harlot, drunken, and mother of abominations. The papacy is the most pestilential abomination of Prince Satan that has ever or ever shall be. The fire and fury of silly blank de blank and Thomas Swine but let those swine come on and burn me if they dare. Here I am, and I will wait for them, and my ashes alone, having been, having been cast after my death <laughs> into a thousand seas, will come back and persecute and harass this abominable crowd. <laughs> Luther did not underestimate the moral character of Catholics. <laughs> That's what Dr. Rutman wrote right there. <laughs> Here's another one right here. Uh, Luther uh, said this, I am conquered by the Holy Scriptures quoted by me, and my conscience is bound in the Word of God. I cannot and will not recant anything, since it is unsafe and dangerous to do anything against the conscience. Now that's a very good quote. That's a very good quote. If you recall, the Inquisition was a brutal time period. It was a horrendous time period. It was a nightmare. In this nightmare, they would torture people mercilessly. They would put you in the iron coffin maiden, and I've described some tortures to you. Fox's Book of Martyrs is a great resource on that one. Or you can simply do a Google type and then just simply look at the horrendous torture that happened during the Inquisition. So Luther had every reason to fear. However, he 
feared more of violating truth Amen. than being tortured. That's important. Uh, a lot of the historical uh, works that I'm going to be explaining to you today can be also based on a black and white film, which is my favorite Christian film, to be honest. It's called Martin Luther, Simple Black and White. Believe it or not, IMDb give it higher than seven points, which is a pretty good movie, okay? That means. So you can watch that one. Not the colored Luther movie, all right? That one's okay, but the black and white was much better. Amen. If you watch that movie, what happened was if Martin Luther, he was basically going to start off in law school. But then what happened, uh, there was a, a lightning coming out and then his horse uh, went backwards and he fell down and then he cried out for mercy and he called out a saint's name and he said, I will become a monk. And then because of that, his life got saved. Hence, he gave up law school and then became, started to commit himself to become an Augustinian monk. So he became an Augustinian monk, but during that time he received no peace. And then one time he told his confessor that I've committed the unpardonable sin. And then his confessor said, what's the sin that's unpardonable? And then Luther said, I can't love God. And then the confessor said, you must love God. Why can't you love God? And Luther said, because all I see is an angry God. Why? Because of the, remember during that time, it was a reign of terror from the Catholic Church. They ruled everything. They controlled your life, even your very soul. And because of this, that's the reason why Luther saw more as an angry God, not a loving God. So then he says, I can't love God. So then the, uh, his confessor was worried about him. So then he decided that what would be best for Luther is that he studied the Bible. Amen. Yeah, amen. <laughs> amen. Because remember, only the priests had the power, had the access to the scriptures that time. So that was the best thing that uh, confessor did for him. So Luther dug himself into the book, studied everything. He got his doctorate. He took a journey to Rome. And after his journey to Rome, he was appalled by the horrific scenes going on over there. That he one time stated, if there was a hell, Rome is built upon it. That's what he actually said. So this guy was something else. So Martin Luther, uh, he was getting grieved and he read the scriptures. He had no peace. Romans 1.17 was where he started Amen. to get under conviction and it said the just shall live by faith. Amen. And because of that, he made a decision right then and there. Salvation is by faith alone. It's not by works. Amen. So his eyes got open. Now, remember Luther during this time. And remember the people during this time, especially the time of Sardis, they weren't really uh, broke free from Catholicism, so to say. They had some Catholic corruptions. Because remember, mainstream Christianity, the main group who had access to the Bible was the Catholic Church. So remember, you got to keep that in your mind. So before we get hard on Luther, you got to realize you probably would have been in worse shape than him. So during that time period, he wasn't uh, the type that would break off from the Catholic Church. He was the type that wanted to reform the church. Hence, his followers were called reformers, reformers. So then it was known as the Protestant Reformation. They protested. So that's, that's Luther's position. But remember, if you go back to ancient Baptists and then to the Waldensians, these guys were, these guys were, uh, they were anti-Catholic. So you want to go to these guys. Luther, it's important to understand, he's more of an in-between guy. He's more of an in-between guy. We include him in our history of Bible-believing Christians. The reason why is because if it weren't for what he did, then the Catholic Empire would have controlled the whole world. So there's no doubt the Lord has mightily used him. Secondly, he was the one who argued about salvation by faith, not by works, which is in a significant way. And then the third thing is we have to give, uh, we have to be a little bit merciful, lenient, because during that time period, I mean, there was no right doctrine that time. So we go by the group that's closest to right doctrine. Now, you would be surprised, you yourself too, you think you got all your doctrines right. But then as you start to spiritually grow more and more in your Christian walk, then you're going to realize, oh, you know. I mean, of course, no pastor in their entire life preaching on the pulpit ever said something wrong. Of course, no one did, right? So we're blameless, you know. 
We're, we're Bible believers, you know. We're, we're perfect, aren't we? See, so that's why you have to have that understanding. That's just a historical reality. People don't understand historical realities. So we go by the best group. That's how we do things. We go by the best group. When we find our best group of Bible believers, that's the team we stick with. That's how we always go through throughout history. Okay? That's how we do things. That way we don't become tolerant of wrong doctrinal groups, but also at the same time we don't become nitpicky. That's how you do things. All right, now anyways, uh, Luther, he's an uh, in-between type of guy, but I consider him as a group in the Bible believers. But he's an in-between type of guy, and we're going to come across an in-between stream pretty soon. Continuing on with Luther's life, uh, he uh, spoke out for the truth, and he became a learned doctor. And there was a duke who protected his life. There were many times he could have been killed, but there was a duke there who respected his intellect and protected his life. Luther, he nailed a 95 to 99 thesis on the door of the Catholic Church. And then when the Pope got word of that, he flipped his lid. So he couldn't believe what he saw. Uh, Luther one time wrote down, if the Pope is filled with so much Christian charity, why don't he empty up all of purgatory? So, <laughs> So then the Pope got ticked off. You know that big Vatican building, St. Peter's Cathedral? You know how that was built? Yeah. Through Pope Leo, where he had Tetzel, his friar, yeah. sell indulgences. And these indulgences, they, basically they're pieces of paper that promises forgiveness of sins. But this indulgence was a special sale indulgence, and Leo wanted it to make it very special. If you bought this piece of paper, full forgiveness of sins, and you can do whatever sin you want, yet you're still forgiven. Mm -hmm. That's horrible. And then the second thing was, there's, if there's a loved one you have burning in purgatory, by this special indulgence, that soul will be free from purgatory and get up to heaven. So uh, Tetzel was the friar who made the sales. Leo uh, had him do it. The Archbishop of Mainz gave him access, and Luther just nailed and pounded the arguments on the door. And then Tetzel got so mad at Luther, the Pope got mad at Luther. He went up inside a debate, and then Luther, he didn't care. Pope, the Pope excommunicated him, as well as the Roman Emperor. Now remember, the most powerful emperor at that time is uh, what they call the Holy Roman Empire. We went through our history class. You notice that that Holy Roman Empire was uh, contained. It was very strong through the reign of Charlemagne and then Otto and those guys, they maintained that Roman Catholic Empire. So it was very powerful. So the most powerful emperor at that time was, uh, uh, I think his name was Charles, but Martin Luther got excommunicated by both the church and the state and he lost everything. However, he stood for the truth. Uh, he made a statement in a debate, a simple layman armed with scripture yeah. is greater than the mightiest pope without it. Amen. Oh, they hated that one. When he had 60 days to retract his writings, Luther said, how much time do I have left? And one of his friends said, tomorrow. And then he built a bonfire and he said, Rome, because you have destroyed the works of God, may God destroy you in these flames. And he tore up that papal bull in half and threw it in the bonfire. And all these Catholics in Witt Wittenberg, Germany said, yeah, and they threw their Catholic items all in the bonfire. And they think I'm rough, right? They think I'm rough. You're laughable. You're laughable, man. Luther had his issues. Unfortunately, he was anti-Semitic, and unfortunately, he was Calvinist, and unfortunately, he believed in sprinkling babies, and the Lord's Supper, he did not really get that right. But like I told you before, that's the reason why he's more of a, uh, he's, he has that little in-between place here. He has that little in-between place. However, we consider him as part of the history of Bible believers. And the reason why is there is no doubt the Lord's hand was on him because of him. There were government rulers at that time who were uh, who yielded and believed Luther's teachings. Amen. So then the Holy Roman Empire, remember that powerful empire, it was breaking apart. So Protestant rulers uh, were being mingled with Catholic rulers. This was really big. So then because of that, it was breaking apart, 
all because of Luther's stance. As a matter of fact, the Emperor Charles, he wanted those uh, rulers, those dukes to get together. And then he said, be united with us under the Catholic Church. If you don't, then uh, something bad could happen to you. There were rumors going around they could be tortured by the Spanish Inquisition. And if you know the Spanish Inquisition, that was the worst type of Inquisition. And then uh, one by one, each and every duke knelt down on the ground and said, if you want to kill me, then you can kill me right now. And they offered his, their head to the, duke, uh, to the Emperor Charles like that. One by one, every duke knelt on the ground and lay down their neck like that. What could Charles do? <laughs> Couldn't do anything about it. So because of that, Luther finally broke, off, uh, broke up the Catholic Empire. That's what Luther was famously known for. And another famous thing about him, he was known for uh, the, uh, Luther's German Bible. So how the Germans were able to have their Bible was because of Luther's German Bible. Now, as Bible believers were going straightway, there was one thing where Luther fell into Calvinism and there was a trap. Now, the one who killed everything, the one who killed everything and destroyed the history of Bible believers, his name is John Calvin. John Calvin, because of this wicked, evil man, I'm sorry if I offended some people, but because of this wicked, evil man, he corrupted a lot of Bible believers throughout history. Because uh, there are a lot of Great Awakening Revival preachers, a lot of preachers, and even today, which is shocking to me, that the Baptist churches, that they find Calvinism attractive, and they're teaching some points of that. I've had some uh, people here who went to independent, fundamental, King James-only churches, and they were teaching one of the tulip forms of Calvinism. This is a poison that has corrupted Bible believers throughout history. The reason why is because the Calvinists are educated. Yeah. Now, when that Christian falls for that trap of higher ed, that's when everything falls apart. Okay? That's why I went to higher ed, so that I can kick you away from your education. Amen. Get you back to the book. Now, there's nothing wrong with growing in knowledge, but come on. Yeah. Wise guy, use your head. If you get a bunch of Calvinists teaching the classes and who have all the research papers and documents and a bunch of liberals, who are you going to believe, fool? You're going to believe them. Yeah. Dummies, man. They don't use their heads, man. They don't use their heads. That's the reason why you have to, uh, People don't believe this, but everyone has a bias. Yeah. Yeah. Everyone has a bias. I don't care who you are. There are scientific paper reports who weighed biases, and it's very interesting study. And yes, there is a liberal bias. Scientists admit that. I mean, Washington Post had an article that about 70% to 80% of university professors are liberal. What do you think they're going to teach? Jesus is God? You're a fool. <laughs> so everyone has a bias. Yeah. The thing is, that's the reason why you have to have a bias on the word of God first. Final authority. If you put that as a bias first, that's going to filter out every garbage out there. Their bias is already set. Their liberal emotional point of views or whatever Dr. Fluffy Fluff says. So once they have their bias set on that one, they're doomed. All right. Anyways. So John Calvin corrupted all of the Bible-believing history. So Luther got corrupted uh, with Calvin's ideals because Calvin's teaching was very, very believable to intellects. And Luther was an intellect. Now, remember, he's an Augustinian monk. Do you remember who taught Calvinism in, in the history class I taught you long before John Calvin? Augustine. Uh, the church father Augustine, I told you, is one of those early church fathers that killed everything. Yeah. He is one of those early church fathers that I don't think, uh, in, to my knowledge, I don't believe him to be a saved man. I think he is burning in hell right now because he's, he is the guy responsible for the birth of the Catholic church and even Calvinism. He is the birth of everything monstrous. Why? Because he's a great doctor and philosopher. Well, fooey. This guy gave birth to two monsters right here. 
Luther was an Augustinian monk, remember? So that's the reason why Calvin, whatever he'll teach, will be believable to him. There was one scholar who had the brains to infiltrate the churches, but always filter it out. Luther, unfortunately, didn't have that, but one guy did, his contemporary, Erasmus. Remember, I told you, Erasmus already had that mindset of being like a spy agent, so to speak. So then he'll play politics, he'll, he'll, uh, you know, he'll butter up the Catholics, but at the same time, behind the scenes, he writes tracts, you know, condemning some of the Catholic leaders. So because of that, see, he, nothing's going to fool him. So then Erasmus actually hated Calvinism. He wrote against Calvinism that time. So remember this, Calvinism, it is a cult. Let me repeat that again for some of you Calvinist scholars. It is a cult. You're a cult. You are a cult. Now, they might say, well, you better be like uh, Ravi Zacharias. You've got to be careful of that word cult and who you call it. It's when you're away from Orthodox mainstream Christianity and it's more modern up to date, then that's a cult. No, you know what a cult is? When it's away from Christianity, that's it. Mainstream Christianity. Mainstream, right? See, when was God ever mainstream? When was God ever mainstream? It's a cult. You know why? Because it is not going back to the cross of Christ. It's a made-up religion that came out because of Augustine. Yeah. And Calvinism is plain as your face a cult. It's called Calvinism. Yeah. All right? So Calvinist, yeah. you're a cult. Before you accuse me of being Rachmanite and a cult, <laughs> you guys are laughable, man. Who's the hypocrite, man? Who's the hypocrite? Now, anyways... Uh, don't get me on. I got to get on to history lesson, right? So I can rant hours against scholars, and I don't want to do that, okay? All right. Anyways, so this was that time period that they came, and Calvinism uh, consists of mainly, famously, tulip. So T-U-L-I-P, abbreviated for total depravity. Total, dep uh, total depravity, it means that basically man is unable Man is unable uh, to have something good in him. So it's as if you're innate to, sin, uh, innate to sin no matter what. So you have a disability to become righteous, disability to get saved, which we don't believe in. Every man has a free choice, free will to do so. Unconditional election is basically without any condition. God just elects or chooses you. You're saved. Well, then that means he elects those who are lost too. He chooses those who are lost. What a cruel God. Uh, limited atonement. Now that's the, probably the most blasphemous one. Basically, Christ's atonement is limited. It's not universal. Jesus truly didn't die for all. If you teach that, you're a heretic. Amen. Irresistible grace. Basically, you cannot resist God's grace. So when God gives you his grace, it's not because you freely chose it. That's what they argue. It's because it was irresistible to you and that's how you got saved. But then what about the lost people, right? So that's pretty sad. Predestination of saints. Now, this is getting popular amongst Baptist circles, so this is dangerous. It's another form of lordship salvation. Basically, what they teach is because when we view your works and viewing the works in your life, then that means you are genuinely saved. So then what if there's a cat? This is what I, I, I can't. This is just so funny to me. Then what if your works are bad? Because they believe once saved, always saved, the Calvinists. Yeah. But then the works are supposed to show that. Okay, what if your works fail? Then, then what happened to once saved, always saved? You know how they argue? You were never saved to begin with then. <laughs> that is ridiculous, man. Yeah. That is ridiculous. Now, notice only dummies who are educated with PhDs would believe in something like that. Did that make any sense to you? Yeah. Now, here's the history of the timeline of the Calvinists. Now, remember, it was during that time period. I am reading The Other Side of Calvinism from Lawrence Vance, and that's probably the number one work against Calvinism. Amen. If you want to also know how to debunk Calvinism, there's a book by Andrew Sluter called Crosshairs with Calvinism, and he keeps up with the modern arguments against Calvinism. So it's really recommended. It's easy to read, too. Those are the two best works 
if you want to debunk Calvinism that I'd recommend. Uh, because I try to keep up with the debates and the scholars and their arguments, you can even watch my videos if you prefer that. There's a playlist specifically on Calvinism. You can watch that. So during this time period, let's see, I already explained some of this history, so I'll uh, skip some of this stuff. So remember, it was broken down with a bunch of Protestants that time, remember? When there were a bunch of Protestants broken up that time, one of the main areas was actually in the Swiss Alps. Zwingli was uh, born in Wild House High in the Swiss Alps on January 1st, 1484. Zwingli is the first guy that would come out right here. So I consider him in this middle line right here with uh, John Calvin. Like most children at that time, he was a member of a large Catholic family. After excelling in his early Latin studies, young Zwingli entered the University of Vienna in 1498. In 1502, he enrolled in the University of Basel, earning two degrees while teaching Latin at another school. He was ordained a priest in 1506 and assumed his first charge at Glarus, southeast of Zurich. Zwingli remained in Glarus for 10 years, during which time he also served as a chaplain with a contingent of Swiss mercenaries. He was by this time an accomplished musician, a classical scholar, a Swiss patriot, and a Roman priest. He then undertook to learn Greek that he might study the New Testament. He also corresponded with Erasmus and later visited him in Basel. So Eurek Zwingli, there's no doubt he's a very pivotal figure during this time of the Protestant Reformation. In 1516, Zwingli removed from Glarus to nearby uh, Einsiedel. Here he read extensively the works of Erasmus and began to preach against the abuses of the Catholic Church. Yeah, see, so Erasmus, we can see right here, once you get into his writings, you tend to be anti-Catholic. He later wrote of this period, quote, I began to preach the gospel before anyone in my locality had so much as heard the name of Luther, for I never left the pulpit without taking the words of the gospel as used in the mass service of the day and expounding them by means of the scriptures. Although at first I relied much upon the fathers as ex expositors and explainers. So Zwingli was similar to Luther. He had that mindset where he's coming off free from the Catholic Church. After two years in Einsiedel, news of Zwingli's ability spread and he was called to Zurich. Here he shocked his parishioners by preaching straight through the books of the New Testament. And although not officially breaking with Rome, Zwingli preached against indulgences and Lenten fasts. On October 10, 1522, he resigned as a priest and became a preacher employed by the city. So the city employed him as their preacher. A series of public disputations were then held in which Zwingli insisted on the primacy of Scripture and attacked the Mass as a blasphemous undertaking. The Mass was soon abolished and the Lord's Supper was celebrated in its place. So in uh, where he's at, at the Swiss Alps, in Switzerland, they were able to be very, very Protestant. That's the reason why we're going to see Calvin was able to find uh, a haven in there. Switzerland, they were, uh, let's see right here. At the time of the Reformation, Vance writes at page 74, Switzerland was a confederation of 13 cantons and a number of free cities like Geneva. The Swiss had successfully maintained their independency since the uniting of the original three German-speaking cantons in 1291. Like the rest of Europe, however, Switzerland was subject to the Pope and only Roman Catholicism was tolerated. And like the rest of Europe, the clergy were corrupted, uh, were corrupt with immorality rampant among the priests. But signs of reform were evident in the German-speaking cantons, most notably in the city of Basel. The Reformation, however, was not inaugurated in Basel. It was to proceed from Zurich, the home of Zwingli. So that's the history of that time. That's why Zwingli was able to be more free in his ways. Because that place was more free from the Holy Roman Empire. That's why there was more religious freedom. 
Well, praise the Lord. Well, but the thing is, it's not as religious freedom as you think. That's the reason why he's in the middle here. It's, uh, they were still combining church and state together. The state was free from the federal government, so to speak. So they have their state government, but the state government combined with the church, if that makes any sense. So it's like America, they want states to be independent, right, from the federal government. So we rely on the state government, which is what we want to go for in politics. But then when it comes to uh, religion, we want to make sure that it's independent from the state. That's where uh, Zwingli, Calvin messed up in. They combined state with the church. That's the reason why he's the bad dude in here. He's in the middle here. It is Zwingli's, uh, but there's one good thing about Zwingli here. This is interesting. This is where you get your Lord's Supper. It is Zwingli's interpretation of the Lord's Supper that sets him apart from Luther. Zwingli held, and rightly so, that the Lord's Supper was a memorial and that the elements merely represented the body and blood of Christ. Luther, on the other hand, held to the presence of Christ in the elements, although he rejected the Catholic doctrine of transubstantiation. So Luther, he's not Catholic mass per se, but you can see, see there's still a little bit of mingling in Catholicism here. The controversy between Luther and Zwingli culminated in the Marburg Colloquy in 1529. Here the two reformers met for the first and only time, and although they agreed on 14 out of 15 articles that were drawn up, they did not reach a consensus on the communion issue. The Reformation in Switzerland spread rapidly throughout the other cantons, most notably in Basel. By 1530, it was firmly established in the leading cities of Switzerland. Meanwhile, war broke out between the Protestant and Catholic canons, uh, cantons. Excuse me. Then after a brief period of peace, they commenced fighting again. This time, however, Zwingli was tragically killed in battle on October 11, 1531. It was said that Zwingli held a sword in one hand and a Bible on the other when he went out to battle, actually. So that's how he died. His successor, his successor in Zurich was Heinrich Bullinger. Bullinger is a very important name during that time period, too. So Bullinger was considered to be a scholar, and Bullinger was the one who took over Zwingli. So after Zwingli, then it went to Bullinger. If we keep uh, reading down right here. Bullinger preached there until his death in 1575. Bullinger was an able replacement, not only maintaining a correspondence with Calvin. So here are big names with Calvin, Melanchthon, Bucer, and Biza. Biza is one of those people responsible for your Greek manuscripts for King James Bible, actually. It's where the Textus Receptus comes from, Biza. So he's a big name. But having a part in the first Helvetic Confession, 1536, and authoring the second Helvetic Confession, 1566. Although, reform, although the reform movements in Germany and the German cantons of Switzerland differed as to their cause, leaders, and practices, there is one thing that they both agreed on. Those who dissented from them were not to be tolerated. That's their problem. So how, how did the cities handle this? They would persecute people who had different religious views from them. This included not only the Catholics, but that noble group of heretics who thought the reformers did not go far enough. Zwingli called them Weider Taufer, if I'm pronouncing that right. You know who they are? We're going to come to them later on. Remember those ancient Baptists that were coming out from Vaudois and Valdingians? The group that came out from these guys were Anabaptists. So Anabaptists were pointing fingers at them, and basically they did a good thing. Yeah, good job Luther, good job Zwingli, and, but you didn't go far enough. You got to believe the Bible. As a matter of fact, the Catholic inquisitors, who they hated the most when they were torturing people, were the Anabaptists. Because Anabaptists would just win debates, because they knew so much scripture. They challenged Zwingli, too, to debate scripture. In Zwingli, Zurich, they were ordered to have their in infants baptized. Rebaptism was made a crime punishable by death. 
On January 5th, 1527, Felix Mance was bound and thrown in the river by the Zurich authorities because he had become involved in Anabaptism. Executions and banishments followed in other Swiss cantons as well. So that's why Zwingli is, was not a good guy. Uh, there's a movie called The Radicals that I'd recommend as well. The Radicals is a good movie on the history of Anabaptists. And you will see from these people that uh, where Calvinists look glorified and polished, that the Anabaptists were the ones rubbed off of history and persecuted. It's like John MacArthur and Calvinists getting all the attention and all polished, but then the Bible-believing Baptists are rubbed off of history and also getting persecuted. There's, no, there's one thing that I learned from history. What men learn from history is that men never learn from history. It's always the same. I see a pattern that repeats. I see a pattern that repeats. Now let's come to the big heretic himself, John Calvin. Okay. John Calvin, uh, let's cover his birth first. John Calvin was a Frenchman born Jean Calvin, Calvin on July 10th, 1509 in Picardy at Noyon, France, 60 miles northeast of Paris. It is from his Latinized name, Johannes Calvinus, that we derive his name in English. Luther was already 25 when Calvin was born. But Calvin hardly outlived the other reformers, dying on May 27, 1564, at only 54 years of age. I wonder why. His father was Gerald Cav Calvin, a notary, who worked for the local Roman Catholic bishop managing the business affairs of the cathedral. John was one of five sons, two dying in infancy. Calvin's mother died when he was about three, and his father remarried a widow and subsequently fathered two daughters. It is interesting to note that Calvin likewise married a widow and had his only son die in infancy. The family was Roman Catholic. His life was filled with a lot of tragedy. Uh, in my eyes, I see it as a consequence. But anyway, some people might get upset at me on that one, but, but that's just my opinion, okay? You can have a different opinion. Due to a financial embarrassment, his father was excommunicated and uh, died in 1531, the year in which his older brother Charles was also excommunicated as a priest for heresy. His younger brother Antoine and one sister Marie left Romanism with him, but one sister remained a papist. At the age of 12, Calvin received part of the revenue of a chaplain's, uh, chaplaincy in the Cathedral of Noyon. So already, Calvin, in spite of a broken up childhood, he was a very intellectual person ever since the young age. That's the reason why a lot of Calvinists like John Calvin, because this guy was a scholar. At this uh, about this time, Calvin was sent to Paris, where he studied Latin, as all higher education at this time was in Latin. Biza relates, and the preliminary grammar course, Calvin left behind his fellow students. Calvin was quiet, never shared in the amusements of his peers, reprimanding their disorders. He then enrolled in the University of Paris at the Collège de Montague, where Ignatius Loyola was to study a few years later. Didn't you know that? Yeah. The founder of the Jesuit order went to the same university as Calvin. Must be a good university. <laughs> After completing his master's degree, Calvin transferred to the University of Orleans to study law. This was due to his father, who realized that his son could make more money in law than in the priesthood. Calvin wrote, My father had intended me for theology from my childhood, but when he reflected that the career of the law proved everywhere very lucrative for its practitioners, the prospect suddenly made him change his mind. At Orleans, Calvin was considered a teacher rather than a pupil, conducting classes when the professor was absent. His next quest for higher education led him to the University of Borges to study under the famed jurist Andrea Alciati. It was also here that he began his study of Greek under the famed German scholar Miltuire Vomar. Upon the death of his father, Calvin returned to Paris to study literature and the Greek and Roman classics. He also further pursued his study of Greek and took up Hebrew as well. It was also here that Calvin came under the influence of humanism and wrote his first book, a commentary on Seneca's De Clementia, but it was never a popular seller. It was a first production of a man famous for other things. It is to remember that the whole of Calvin's education and early life was spent as a Roman Catholic. This is important, not 
much is known about the circumstances of Calvin's conversion since. In spite of his, uh, uh, in spite of his writings, he made only one reference to it. So his salvation testimony is also abstract. That's the reason why Calvinism, it's kind of dangerous with their teachings. With Tulip, it makes their salvation testimony abstract. You don't know when they got saved. So here's Calvin's testimony, which makes it very abstract. And in the first place, because I was so obstinately addicted to the superstitions of the papacy, that was very hard to draw me from that deep slough. By a sudden conversion, he, God, subdued and reduced my heart to docility, which for my age was over much hardened in such matters. Having consequently received some taste and knowledge of true piety, I was forthwith inflamed with so great a desire to reap benefit from it that although I did not at all abandon other studies, I yet devoted myself to them more indifferently. Now I was greatly astonished that before a year passed, all those who had some desire for pure doctrine betook themselves to me in order to learn, although I myself had done little more than begin. You know what that sounds like? A typical arrogant Calvinist. Yeah. Like you hear all these other people judging other people. You're not really saved. You're not really saved as me, as me, as me, because I know more Bible. I know this doctrine and stuff like that. that arrogant. Calvinists call me arrogant. Ain't that funny? You know why they call me arrogant? Because I criticize them. Yeah. That's why they call me arrogant. I only criticize arrogant people. <laughs> and if you think I'm arrogant for doing that, I think you need a heart check. It's like as if you like, to be, uh, you like to be brainwashed by arrogant people. Okay, anyways. Page 80 in uh, Lawrence Vance's book, it continues reading. Calvin arrived in Geneva in July of 1536 with his brother Antoine and sister Marie. So Geneva, Switzerland. So remember that. That's his headquarters. He intended to stay the night before going on to Strasbourg when the Genevan reformer, Julami Farrell, who had been in the city for two years already, heard that Calvin was in Geneva and pressed him to stay and help him with the Reformation, then in progress in the city against the Church of Rome. So remember, Switzerland during that time was already anti-Catholic. It's uh, invaded with a lot of Protestantism or Reformation ideology. That's why Calvin was able to get in. Uh, Calvin relates that Pharaoh proceeded to warn me that God would curse my retirement and tranquility, which I sought for my studies, if I withdrew and refused to help when it was so urgently needed. That's the reason why he stayed in Geneva, Switzerland. Worst decision he made. After beginning as a reader in Holy Scripture, in which he lectured on the Pauline epistles, Calvin soon assumed the office of pastor. A catechism and a confession of faith were then presented to the city council along with a document entitled Articles Concerning the Organization of the Church and of Worship at Geneva. After these were adopted by the council, numerous, pay attention, church state stuff, communist stuff, numerous laws were passed against vice and for the regulation of church worship and discipline. Assent to the confession of faith was made mandatory for all citizens of Geneva, and banishment was decreed for those who would not acquiesce. Uh, thus, as Schaff relates, it was a glaring inconsistency that those who had just shaken off the yoke of popery. Now, this is big. This is Philip Schaff. He's a famous church historian. Even he admitted this was hypocritical. He said, it was a glaring inconsistency that those who had just shaken off the yoke of popery as an intolerable burden should subject their conscience and intellect to a human creed. In other words, substitute for the old Roman popery a modern Protestant popery. Amen. Amen and amen. It was time for new elections in Geneva in early, in early 1538, and a change in government subsequently took place. With the election fraud, Biden, Calvin, and Farrell, they got voted in. No, just kidding. All right. <laughs> what happened was, this is funny, Calvin and Farrell fell out of favor and were banished from the city in April of 1538. You know why? Botner, although trying to defend Calvin, nevertheless explains the reason why. 
due to, quote, due to an attempt of Calvin and Farrell to enforce a too severe system of discipline in Geneva, it became necessary for them to leave the city temporarily. That's why. That's why. I'll read some examples, which, uh, but before I read some examples, let me finish off Calvin's life. When Calvin arrived in Geneva, he entered the pulpit he had previously vacated and began to expound the scriptures from the same place where he had left off in 1538. So he returned. They allowed him to return. He was to spend the rest of his life in Geneva, preaching, teaching, and writing until his death 23 years later on May 27, 1564. Calvin was buried in an unmarked grace as he had wished. Biza conducted the funeral and afterward wrote the first of many biographies of Calvin. So that's how Calvin's life end. Now, some of his uh, restrictions and rules, here's some of them, okay? Page 83 of Vance's book. Consequently, a set of severe regulations were introduced even before Calvin arrived in the city. There were laws governing dress, music, games, church attendance, dancing, blasphemy, and oaths. Education became free but compulsory. One citizen who refused to attend sermons was imprisoned, forced to go hear sermons, and finally banished from the city. Now to, now to churches, this sounds very entertaining, right? Like, maybe we should have something like that. But that's when, you, uh, that's when church mingles with state. You know, this Bible-believing churches, we don't force you. This is all volunteer stuff. Amen. We let the preaching of the Word of God convict you. Amen. And not even God, not even God makes a mandatory stuff where He finds you for something. He disciplines His child, don't get me wrong on that, but He's not a church-state church government. They're thinking about theocracy. Now, remember, Muhammad had that problem. The one who had his problem keeping his pants up. That guy, Muhammad, had a theocracy issue. And that's the same thing that the Calvinists had. And that's the reason why, listen, open your ears, in today's politics with everything running, that's why a lot of people who are going to preachers who are the forefront of that, Calvinists are the ones championing on that. Why? They have that mentality of church state. Why? They don't believe in God bringing down the kingdom himself where he sets everything right, not us. The world gets worse and worse. We believe in that. But certainly not people who believe in Calvinists. They believe they can bring a little bit of the kingdom themselves. Naturally, there were many residents of Geneva who rebelled against the strict system of discipline. Yeah, no kidding. It was into this unstable environment that Calvin entered in 1536. But rather than separating the church from the state, Calvin used the power of the state to enforce his system of discipline. Here are several examples. A hairdresser was imprisoned for two days for arranging a bride's hair in an unseemly manner. <laughs> two Anabaptists were banished from the city on account of their theological views. <laughs> Penalties were assessed for making a noise or laughing during church. A gambler was publicly punished. Many of the leaders of the opposition to Calvin <coughs> excuse me, were among those who at first supported the reform efforts. Thus, Calvin's reign in Geneva was doomed to failure. So at the beginning, they were supportive, but now they were seeing that, hey, we're not really free. Calvin's banishment and recall to Geneva has already been mentioned. Schaff maintains the inevitability, uh, the in, what does that mean? Okay, I think that's uh, improper grammar, but anyway, maintains the inevitability of Calvin's return trip. Calvin was foreordained for Geneva and Geneva for Calvin. Both have made their calling and election sure. <laughs> that's pretty funny. I, I can see that Schaff didn't really favor Calvin then, it sounds like. We are told by Calvinists that Calvin envisioned a model Christian community based on the Bible and uh, based on the Bible and pattern after the early church. Isn't that what you're hearing all the Calvinist preachers right now doing too? 
This has been variously termed a theocracy, a bibliocracy, a clero clerocracy, and a Christocracy. The rules and regulations introduced in Geneva during Calvin's ministry left no area of life untouched. This is why Calvin has frequently been labeled the Genovese dictator who would tolerate in Geneva the opinions of only one person, his own, <laughs> quote on end of quote. Besides the usual laws against dancing, profanity, gambling, and immodesty, the number of dishes eaten at a meal was regulated. Now that's communist, man. That's communist. <laughs> Attendance at public worship was made mandatory and watchmen were directed to see that people went to church. We should uh, update our security, Brother Bob. <laughs> Who's missing, you know? <laughs> Oh my goodness, this was messed up. Press censorship was instituted and books judged to be heretical or immoral were banned. Interest on loans were ca was capped at 5%. The naming of children was regulated. Can you believe that? <laughs> if that ain't communists, I don't know what is. I don't even think that Kim Jong-un does that, you know? <laughs> This guy's a dictator, man. At least Kim Jong-un would name the, uh, have the people name the child whatever they want. <laughs> My goodness. Naming a child after a Catholic saint was a penal offense. During an outbreak of plague in 1545, over 20 persons were burnt alive for witchcraft, and Calvin himself was involved in the prosecutions. From 1542 to 1546, 58 people were executed and 76 exiled from Geneva. Torture was freely used to extract confessions. The Calvinist John McNeil admits that, quote, in Calvin's later years and under his influence, the laws of Geneva became more detailed and more stringent, end of quote. Calvin was involved in every conceivable aspect of city life safety regulations to protect children, laws against recruiting mercenaries, new inventions, the introduction of cloth manufacturing, and even dentistry. Imagine that uh, as Tom's pastor, I tell him how he does dental work. And I didn't even apply for dental school. How laughable, man. Now, do you see why I'm, I bash Calvinists? you got to be a dummy to fall for this Calvinism nonsense. And they get on Ruckman's life? Come on, man. Who are you kidding me, man? Who are you kidding me? You know, you got divorced twice, remarried three times. Is that the best you can do? Your hero, Calvin, burnt people at the stake. Good night, man. People are very funny, aren't they? Anyways. He was consulted not only on all important state affairs, but on the supervision of the markets and assistance for the poor. Calvin was especially severe with incorrigible adulterers. He favored the death penalty. Those guilty of fornication or adultery were fined and imprisoned. Nevertheless, these laws did not stamp out adultery, for Calvin's own sister-in-law and stepdaughter were found guilty. Calvin's theory of a theocracy is professed to be based on the Holy Scriptures, but as Schaff astutely observes, quote, it is impossible to deny that this kind of legislation savors more of the austerity of old heathen Rome and the Levitical code than of the gospel of Christ, and that the actual exercise of discipline was often petty, pedantic, and unnecessarily severe. It is not surprising that there was much opposition to Calvin, among the residents of Geneva. Many who opposed Calvin during his first stay in the city were as equally antagonistic toward him when he returned. In 1547, a threatening letter was found on Calvin's pulpit. Quote, Gross hypocrite, thou and they companions will gain little by your pains. If you do not save yourselves by flight, nobody shall prevent your overthrow and you will curse the hour when you left your monkery. So you can see the, uh, the people were happy with John Calvin as their Biden president. Page 86. 
The doctrines of Calvin were not the only things that were spoken against in Geneva. Calvin himself was increasingly harassed and made the object of ridicule. Like Biden. He is Biden. I know that MacArthur and Washer and those guys might get upset at me, but John Calvin is like Biden. Dogs were named after him and songs were written to mock him. Guns were fired outside his window late at night. In 50, 40, 1554, Calvin wrote, quote, Dogs bark at me on all sides. Everywhere I am saluted with the name of heretic, and all the calamities that can possibly be invented are heaped upon me. In a word, the enemies among my own flock attack me with greater bitterness than my declared enemies among the papists. Don't that sound like Biden and the liberals mourning? Like, we're getting so much division in our own country, complaining about our own leader, and our own leader, more than the outsiders out there, more than Russia, more than China, and he is Biden. You Calvinists don't learn from history. What men learn from history is that men never learn from history. Calvin also faced opposition from the city council for some of his ideas. No kidding. And no, this is a scholastic work. This is an, an amateur work. He documented based on church history books. Schaff is a famous mention and even Calvinists. Okay? So read that one. So I, will, I would like to advertise it to you Calvinists right here, the other side of Calvinism, all right? Go buy that book because you plaster my name over, all over your social media and you get a lot of views on that one. You wouldn't be famous if it weren't for me. Yeah, I sound arrogant, I know. You know why? Rub it off on those arrogant people. All right, but anyway, we can see that this day and age of... Uh, uh, in this day and age where Philadelphia is, co is coming out in the scenes and Luther opened the gates, unfortunately, you notice as we study history, the devil always follows the, take, uh, the, tail, uh, the coattails. Yeah. He always does that. So when the Bible believers are about to have their advantage through this one, then here comes the Calvinists. And you'll see that throughout the entire Philadelphian age and the Laodicean age. The Calvinism just corrupted corrupted the Bible-believing movement. So that's why they're in the middle over here. And remember this, both Calvinism and Catholicism do have one thing in common, okay? It comes from Augustine. It comes from Augustine. And remember, that guy is an evil, evil dude. He's an evil church father. Okay, let's close with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much uh, for the history lesson where we don't repeat people's mistakes. And I pray also that we see the dangers and the errors of Calvinism and higher education. And Lord, I'm not, uh, I'm not downing on growing in knowledge, but Heavenly Father, we see the tendency of higher ed. It's a tendency to lean upon our own understanding rather than the Holy Spirit. We have to make the book the final authority and not higher ed. And I pray that you'll dismiss us now with your blessing. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.